In the early hours of January 24th, 1978, people saw something strange fall out of the sky. No one knew exactly what it was or where it came from, but they can tell something was up. Am I going to see my kids again? Am I going to see my mom and dad? I'm Denizen Ake Kong. This is Operation Morning Light, a new eight-part series. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. I've just woken up from a rough night's sleep on a rock-hard mattress in my damp motel room at the Parkfield Inn. To me, it seems like your average small-town motel. Buy a strip mall wedged between a Walmart and a Taco Bell. There's a coin-operated ice machine next to the lobby that sounds like it was in my room all night long. Breakfast is included in the price. Jimmy Dean sausages, biscuits and homemade gravy, and coffee that tastes like jet fuel. At the front desk, there's a sign in big blue letters that reads, Please do not clean fish in rooms. That is here because we had some lovely fishermen that came and visited and decided that it was important to clean their fish in their room bringing their fish that they've caught for the day and filling their bathtub up and cutting them up and cleaning them, gutting them, scaling them, and bagging them. Michelle, the Parkfield Inn manager, says some of these fishermen would sleep on the very same bed where they had gutted the fish hours before. They slept in the room, slept with the smell. It makes Hannibal Lecter look like an amateur. So we have had to post the sign and it's happened multiple times. We've tried to take the sign away and fishermen continue to try again. (laughs) Michelle had to hire a contractor to gut three of the hotel rooms. But the smell of fish guts lingered for years. Thank goodness for insurance, we'll just say that because the rooms were completely gutted all the way through the sheetrock. These days, fishermen are required to hand over their catch to the front desk so it can be put in the deep freeze. So what's it like in here when it starts to become snagging season? A zoo. (laughs) It is a zoo. We are full house with nothing but fishermen and boats filling our parking lot. It's pretty crazy. And it's all season long, not just snagging. We have fishing tournaments that go on all summer. Start in the spring, end in the fall, and every weekend we are full. I wonder, were any of Michelle's fishermen part of our smuggling ring? I'm Helen Holliman. From Imperative Entertainment and Vespucci, this is the Paddlefish Caviar Heist. Episode 4, Operation Roadhouse. If you think cash back at thousands of your favorite stores sounds too good to be true, think again. With Rakuten, you can save on whatever you're buying for the holidays. So while you're getting gifts for friends and family, get some cash back for yourself, too. Don't forget festive home decor, party outfits, and that trip to see your fam. Because shopping for everything is much more magical with cash back. Rakuten makes it so easy. Here's how it works. Rakuten partners with stores you know and love. Places like American Eagle, Aveda, Finish Line, GameStop, Lancome and more. These stores actually pay Rakuten for sending them shoppers. And Rakuten shares that money with you as cash back. You can even stack coupons and deals on top of cash back. Cha-ching! Shop at Rakuten.com or by using the Rakuten app and you'll get your cash back payments through PayPal or check. It's that easy. Start your holiday shopping with Rakuten now to save money at over 3,500 stores. Join for free at Rakuten.com or get the Rakuten app. That's R-A-K-U-T-E-N. Rakuten.com. Good evening. Something scary happened yesterday. Something science fiction buffs have been telling us for years was going to happen. In the early hours of January 24th, 1978, people saw something strange fall out of the sky. 
No one knew exactly what it was or where it came from, but they can tell something was up. They said, well, we'd like your help on something. This is very confidential. You can't talk to anybody about it. Am I going to see my kids again? Am I going to see my mom and dad? I'm Denizen Ake Kong, and this is the untold story of what really happened back in 1978 and how that light in the sky is still impacting my home and my people 44 years later. This is Operation Morning Light, a new eight-part series from Imperative Entertainment in Vespucci. Follow and listen wherever you get your podcasts. When the Soviet Union collapsed, the Russian mafia dusted off their fishing rods and caused sturgeon stocks to plummet in the Caspian Sea. This caviar shortage, half a world away, brought a new wave of poachers to Missouri looking for cheap alternatives. Rob Farr told us about his role in bringing down a major commercial poaching operation back in the 1980s. Although he helped raise the alarm in 2009, Operation Roadhouse was coordinated at a state and federal level. So today, I'm meeting one of the agents on that team. All right, so we are at the Department of Conservation here in Missouri, in Jefferson City. Hi. Hi. Hello. Are you Randy? I am. I'm Helen. Hi, Helen. Nice yeah. to meet you. Thanks so much. Trip over. Great. Randy Doman is the chief of enforcement here. Well, this is part of our complex. Yeah, with the department, we've got, what, well, roughly 1,500 or so employees across the entire state. I have a thousand building. questions for him. We have a training building where we have... Randy leads us into a brown mid-century building. Right now. Lisa is our office manager. Hi. Mm. This is Helen. They're here to talk about the, the roadhouse. Oh. In the front entrance, a panoramic mural shows off Missouri's varied wildlife. There's paintings of wild ducks, trout, bobcats, and paddlefish. I feel like I've stepped back in time to the late 1960s. It smells like an old library. Randy is tall and trim, with round glasses and brown spiky hair. We sit down in his office, and I begin by asking, what does his department actually do? We're kind of a jack-of-all-trades. We wear a lot of different hats. So it's very difficult to become an agent, and we pride ourselves in our level of education and training that it takes to get to this position. Conservation is their main focus, but his officers are also responsible for law enforcement. Something Randy learned early on in his career when he encountered a wanted man hiding out in a national park. This guy made it very clear that he wasn't gonna go back to jail. And at the time, you know, I was a young, naive officer. I was in plain clothes. For whatever reason, he asked me, do you have your gun on you? I said, well, yeah. Why? Because one of us is going to die tonight. And so that kind of got the hair on the back of my neck up just a little bit. This time, Randy had no backup. So luckily, I was able to talk with him and verbal judo, if you will, and get him in custody, get him handcuffed. But I remember that statement in very calm, clear voice. One of us is going to die tonight. And so that's the kind of reality that some of our officers have to deal with on a regular basis. The risk these officers face can be more complicated than for a traditional cop. It's not just humans. You've also got to worry about bears, snakes, bobcats, or anything else that Mother Nature might throw your way. I wanted to hear about Operation Roadhouse. Whose idea was this elaborate sting? Back in 2009, 2010, when we started getting this increased information from the local citizens and through our local agents, we enlisted the help of our special investigation supervisor. And he was one of the best in the business, very creative in his ideas and his approach to apprehending flagrant wildlife violators, commercial wildlife violators that are professional poachers, not just the run of the mill over limit, you know, spotlighters, but the folks who professionally exploited Missouri's fish, forest, and wildlife resources. And through his creativity, we came up with the idea of rather than trying to infiltrate 
a group of very loosely banded paddlefish snaggers, why not have them come to us? Randy is light on details, but we're able to learn more from another source involved in the sting who didn't want to go on the record. So the agent who dreamt up Operation Roadhouse was head of the Conservation Department's Special Investigations Unit. He has earned quite the reputation when it comes to pulling off undercover stings. Throughout his decades of service, he has come up with all sorts of elaborate schemes. In southern Missouri, he set up a fake taxidermy shop with a hidden camera behind the counter. Then, as hunters came in to sell their illegal kills, this agent would capture footage of them bragging. They literally walked into his trap. So when this agent gets a call from Rob Farr back in 2009, he decides to make the trip down to the Ozarks to assess the scene. When he sees the dead paddlefish dumped on riverbanks and stream beds, he agrees this is probably the work of an organized group. You might think, with their accents alone, a bunch of newly arrived Eastern Europeans would stick out in a place like Warsaw. And maybe they do, but you can't arrest someone just for being a tourist. So how can they catch these guys? The team has several options. They can increase the number of patrols on the water, driving around to spot Eastern Europeans catching too many fish. It would send a clear signal, but with such a vast area to cover, they simply don't have the manpower. Or just like in the 1980s, they can hang out at local bars like the Ore House and try to eavesdrop on conversations. But none of them speak Russian. They could try hitting the motels and try to catch guys processing fish in their rooms. But it's a tourist town. And with so many locations, even finding them would be a challenge. In the end, it's settled. The poachers will come to them. They'll run their own lakeside bar. This agent invents a persona for himself. Gary Hamilton is a reliable, easygoing fishing guide with a Midwestern twang who is willing to get these Eastern European fishermen whatever they need. The agent would have to live as Gary for the next two years so that he doesn't blow his cover. A lot of these folks were already coming to our special investigators anyway, offering to buy their fish. And most of the activity, not all of it, but most of it took place below the bridge there, going into Warsaw, across from Lake of the Ozarks, there at the Roadhouse Dock. Most of the guys suspected of poaching would hang out at this restaurant called the Roadhouse, which has its own fishing dock. The plan was this, lease the property, set up a fake bait shop inside, and kit it out with hidden cameras to capture the poachers in the act. I know what you're thinking. When does Patrick Swayze show up? Snagging season rolls around. Everything is set. In March 2011, the Eastern Europeans arrive in town. They're driving flashy cars with out-of-state license plates. Many of them make their way to the roadhouse. Here, they drop hundreds of dollars on fishing bait and drink vodka shots with their breakfast. They have no idea that the guys selling them fishing permits or taking them out for day-long paddlefish excursions are actually undercover cops. They came to us versus us trying to go all over the place to them. So that made us much more efficient and frankly much more effective at trying to identify and apprehend those individuals who were solely in it for the caviar or the money made by buying and selling of the row. Operation Roadhouse is going exactly to plan. Agents immediately record all kinds of offenses. The sheer number of people taking more than the two paddlefish limit points toward a wider smuggling conspiracy. The two-year investigation involved six different Missouri conservation agents and one Federal Fish and Wildlife Service special agent. It's going so well that the team decides to repeat the roadhouse sting again the following spring. And so our special investigators worked for two years to document 
that volume of illegal activity there at the Roadhouse Dock. But things are going too smoothly. When an investigation like this goes on, you worry about your officers having their cover being blown because they're dealing with some people that can be very dangerous people. And so you're always concerned about somebody saying something wrong or somebody identifying one of your special investigators. That's something that we lose sleep over all the time. If anyone knows about risk, it's Gary Hamilton, the friendly middle-aged man running the roadhouse dock. When he isn't behind the till selling fishing permits to unwitting suspects, Gary is busy making detailed notes for future arrest warrants. Hamilton is living on site, sleeping in a camper van at the dock. But one night, things get real ugly. Gary Hamilton is drifting off to sleep when he's startled awake by a loud noise. Peeling back the curtain, he sees two rival groups of fishermen squaring up to each other by the water's edge. Lit by the flickering flames of a bonfire, they're about to start a vodka-fueled brawl. We had a situation where some of the locals got into it with some of the folks that were from out of town. A brawl broke out in the parking lot of Operation Roadhouse there, the dock there. As the shouting in Slavic languages grow louder, Gary Hamilton swings open the door of his camper van. Fists and beer bottles are flying. There are too many weapons. Fishing hooks, concealed handguns. Someone raises a fishing paddle above their head. One fisherman hits the ground, blood pouring from a knife wound on his face. Watching the carnage unfold, Gary Hamilton is in a bind. Should he intervene or not? As a law enforcement officer, of course you're gonna step in and keep somebody from getting hurt. But you were blowing your cover by doing that in a situation like this, and how do you handle that? And still stay in a covert capacity. And that's the kind of split-second decision-making that our special investigators have to make is, okay, at what point and how do I intervene here to keep somebody from getting hurt without jeopardizing a two-year investigation in the process? Somehow, a full-on bloodbath is averted. The officers have kept their cover. But the conservation team isn't investing all this time, money, and personnel in order to break up fistfights. They're here to bring down a criminal network. This season on Cover Story. He's the most uh, articulate, he's the most savvy, he's very cunning. It seemed like the perfect story. The kind that only comes around once or twice in a journalist's career. Like, he's very, very good. It's why he destroys everybody. Out in the woods of Montana, one billionaire was creating his own world, all so he could hide something truly despicable. Have you heard of girls being, like, followed? Is that something you've experienced? At least, that's what we were told. You ask if I consider him a friend or if he's someone I trust. Both are absolutely yes. I would trust him with my life. This season on Cover Story, what actually happened? It happens once in everybody's life, and this guy is a master liar. Master liar. Cover Story Season 2, Seed Money. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Influencer. It's a word that gets tossed around a lot these days. But what exactly is an influencer? Well, there is a woman who went the distance, who went beyond the dazzle, who broke ground as the first true influencer by living a remarkable life. She had power, real power, and longevity influencing generations. Her name, Elizabeth Taylor. I know she was loud. I know she was hysterically funny. I know she swore. But Elizabeth said how painfully shy she was. She went on perfume tours. And the places were mobbed just to see her. She was starting to try and take control of her life. But then tragedy and life kind of got in the way. I'm Katy Perry. And Elizabeth Taylor has fascinated, inspired, and influenced me as an artist, woman, and an advocate. This is the story of the original influencer. This is Elizabeth I. It's March 13th, 2013. Randy Doman wakes up at the crack of dawn. 
He's nervous and excited as he sips his morning coffee. He takes a shower, puts on his uniform, and walks over to the fairgrounds at the Missouri State Fair in Sedalia, a town just north of Warsaw. Operation Roadhouse is about to reach its boiling point. To do this right, you don't want to spread it out over four or five days where people get on the phone and evidence disappears and people are hard to find. You try and do it as much as you can simultaneously to where you can gather all the evidence and gather all your suspects and serve all your warrants roughly at the same time. The sting operation started in Warsaw, but has grown into a multi-million dollar nationwide effort. The paddlefish row has been tracked across state lines, a federal crime. Arriving at the makeshift headquarters, Randy Doman gets hyper-focused. He is about to execute a national takedown. Once the clock strikes 7 a.m., there is no room for error. Randy is coordinating 125 state and federal agents, split into 30 teams. The operation is split across four time zones as they swoop to arrest the unsuspecting poachers. One misstep, and someone could get hurt. Well, if I'm going to be perfectly honest, I was wishing I could be out there with them. <laughs> but what's going through my head is the safety of the officers during the takedown. You know, are they going to run across somebody that's got a felony warrant or doesn't want to go to jail or who has other violations that we're not even aware of? Anytime you serve an arrest warrant, there may be an individual that has other issues going on, illegal drugs, the other trafficking, other issues there that we're not aware of. If the arrests were spread out, then word might spread. Evidence could be destroyed. Suspects might disappear. So the takedown is tightly coordinated, with arrests taking place simultaneously across 19 states. So when it was all said and done, yeah, I think there's a several of us that went out to dinner afterwards and kind of celebrated, and I'll leave it at that. <laughs> As Randy talks about partnering with a dozen state and federal agencies to catch the criminals, his pride is obvious. To pull off an investigation of this magnitude and this complexity over basically a three-year time span. You're talking two years of special investigations and a year later for the takedown over a bunch of different states, over 112 or so individuals. The scope of that is really significant. With nobody getting hurt, with great convictions, is a pretty remarkable accomplishment when you're talking partnerships with dozens of different states coordinating with their officers so they can meet our officers and the fish and wildlife officers and find these individuals that are scattered all across the country. I asked Randy if he uncovered evidence of a black market. Based on the amount of money these folks were paying the investigators to buy the paddlefish, you know they were turning a pretty good profit on the other end when they're forking out thousands of dollars for paddlefish grow. If they're willing to buy it for that much, you know they're selling it for a lot more. What's impressive is the sheer scale. A three-year investigation results in more than 112 suspects. Federal indictments of eight individuals charged with interstate and international smuggling. If the aim is to curb paddlefish poaching by taking these guys off the streets, then Operation Roadhouse is a smashing success. But what's still not clear is where all this illegal row was going and whether the kingpins behind the smuggling ring were caught. On the drive back from Jefferson City to Warsaw, we decided to take a quick detour. Head northwest on Warsaw Avenue toward Banning Road, then your destination will be on the right. We turn off just past the Highway 65 bridge on the Lake of the Ozarks and Warsaw Avenue. This is where the old Roadhouse Bar once stood. We're standing outside what looks like a shuttered restaurant. The Roadhouse Bar seems to have been replaced by the R Bar and Grill, offering steaks, burgers, and seafood pasta. There's no signs of life. There's tables, em empty, completely abandoned restaurant. It's actually cleaner than I expected it to look. 
behind the old roadhouse is the White Branch Marina. And out on the beautiful lakefront, someone's having a party. There are ladies in bikinis. There are gents that are completely sunburned and drinking cheap beer on boats right now, having a lovely summer afternoon. It is hot as hell. But over 10 years ago, this place where I'm standing right now was the site of a major sting operation. I want to solve this case. But I'm becoming frustrated that I still don't have any real leads behind this poaching operation. These fishermen would pull up to the roadhouse. They'd go inside, purchase a permit, and then they'd be on their way down this road I'm standing on right now, this loading dock. And they'd walk onto the marina and go off to go snag, but little did they know that they were likely purchasing a permit from Gary Hamilton, who was posted up living out of that RV. And I can only imagine the mind frame and the mindset that he had to be in this whole time in order to make this thing work. It sounds incredibly stressful. I need names and addresses, and I'm not gonna get that kind of information from tight-lipped law enforcement guys. Thankfully, we have a plan B. My producer, Aaron, has been busy in the background running Freedom of Information Access requests. And finally, we've gotten our hands on a treasure trove of Operation Roadhouse court documents. We now have more than 600 pages of warrants, statements, and court transcripts. It's exhilarating. I feel like I might at last be holding the key to understanding exactly who was pulling the strings. That's next time. The Paddlefish Caviar Heist is a production of Imperative Entertainment and Vespucci and is written and hosted by me, Helen Holliman. For Imperative Entertainment, the executive producer is Jason Hoke. For Vespucci, the executive producers are Daniel Turkin and Johnny Galvin. David Gavi Herbert is executive producer, based on original reporting by David Gavi Herbert. The series producer is Aaron Keller. The story editor is Matt Willis. Thomas Curry is the managing producer. Audio recording by Austin Sizzler at Eastside Studios. Audio mix and sound design by Matt Peaty. <laughs>